thank you thank you thank you krish thank you so much yep. thanks again david we will move on to our second talk this morning about quantum entanglement as presented by dan watts also from the university of york in the uk okay thanks Nikita. good morning good morning okay i will share my screen We've lost you. Yeah, I'm just Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Mhm. Mm Perfect. Okay. okay, sorry for that delay there. Um, Perfect. I'll start my video as well. Okay, is that okay now? Really? Okay. Okay, so thank you uh, for the invite to talk at this really very nice conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about. MEV scale photon quantum entanglement and some of the work we've been doing. Um, so the work I'll present today um, has been done with um, colleagues from York listed here. Also working with an industrial partner, Chromec, and on the simulation side, we've also been working with people at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, but this project, of course, is, as Dave mentioned, is part of this uh, Global Challenges Award that we, we recently obtained. So we're also working with the fantastic students at Zululand and uh, Western Care uh, as the project goes forward, which is a real benefit all around. Okay, so I appreciate this conference is, you know, the... Um, geared a lot towards students. So I thought before I went into quantum entanglement, I'd just give a, a little primer, a sort of an experimentalist's kind of um, comments on what quantum entanglement is. So any theorists in the audience might want to cover their ears for that part. Um, I'll then talk specifically about entanglement in positron annihilation gamma photons. Uh, talk about some of the basic theory behind that. Um, we'll then discuss about the new Géant Force simulation that we've developed in which quantum entanglement is included for the first time. Uh, and we'll compare these predictions to quality data we obtained on the double Compton scattering of these positron annihilation gamma in a CZT, so a semiconductor gamma detection system from Chromec. Um, so we'll, we'll show these comparisons and hopefully you'll see that entanglement really is needed um, in any simulations of, of things like PET and other things, and then talk about some of the future plans. Okay, so quantum entanglement, what is it at a very basic level? So as Feynman said, almost everything in quantum mechanics is, is in the two slit experiments, one of the most beautiful experiments done in physics. Um, so we'll use that as our basis. So in a double slit experiment, you have two slits, slit one and slit two, and you have something approaching the slits. So that could either be light, it could be electrons, could be Buckminster Fullerenes, I think is the, the heaviest um, system for which this has been measured. And of course, you're familiar that if you have this kind of two slit experiment, you observe a diffraction pattern in where you detect the particles. So you get positions of uh, constructive and destructive interference, and you get this diffraction pattern, which we'll call P12. If you block off one of the slits, of course, then what you, you observe is a kind of lump of events behind the slit, pretty much like you would get if you were firing bullets at the wall. Um, and we'll call this pattern P1. If you block the other slit, you get a lump of particles here, call that P2. Um, if you somehow infer and obtain information about which slit the particle came through, you observe this pattern here, which is P1 plus P2. 
And note that it doesn't have the interference effects um, that you saw in the first plot. If you did, if you determine which one of the slits it went through, not but not having detectors on both, you still observe this pattern. Um, and so, what does this effectively mean? Okay, so like in the first example, if you don't observe which path is taken, you must sum the wave functions for each path first. So the total wave function is this wave function emanating from slit one, this one emanating from slit two, and then you take the modulus squared of this, this sum. So this obviously also includes the interference between these two different wave functions. And so this kind of wave function is entangled. If we observe which path um, the particle went through, you sum the probabilities separately. So rather than having, as shown above, this combination then the mod squared, you actually take the mod squared of each individual wave function. And then you're not getting the, the kind of the interference or the entanglement. So this is what's known as a separable wave function because the, wave, the two wave functions can be separated and don't occur in this combined entangled way. So if you don't measure, as in the case of the first example with the two slits, a uh, quantum system is described by the superposition of two or more states, each described by a different wave function, as shown here. And these factors P and Q are just the amount it is in each state. So, um, so this applies to the two slits in the two slit experiment, two spin states, an electron can be spin up or spin down. These are the two states in that scenario. And also of relevance for us are the two polarization states of a photon. So that's before you make a measurement. If you make a measurement, so assume you've inferred and um, obtained information about which state the particle is in, uh, then the system is forced into one state or another. So the, the combined system will collapse into either state one with the probability of P squared, where P was the factor of how much it is in that state, and it can drop into the other one with a probability of Q squared. So this process is often referred to as collapsing of the wave function. When you get when you make a measurement, the entanglement collapses, and it and it um, the system is forced into one state or another. Okay, so now we've had a brief introduction of what entanglement is. Let's talk about um, entanglement in positron annihilation gamma. Okay, so in positron annihilation, of course, you have an electron and a positron, which annihilate to give out two gammas coming out opposite directions back to back. Um, and these are quantum entangled. Okay. So the dominant process uh, um, is that the, the annihilation is at rest. Um, so therefore, the, the initial system of positronium, so in this process, the positrons become thermalized and then become bound into positronium. And then the ground state of this positronium annihilates the two gammas. So this initial system has zero angular momentum. So as shown on this diagram here, the two photons come out with orthogonal polarization to conserve this angular momentum. But also the ground state of positronium is negative parity. So that also creates quite strict restrictions on which states are possible. Um, and so from the, the annihilation of this ground state, there is only one possible wave function, which comes from the different combinatorics of the direction of the photon and its polarization orientation. So that's the kind of equivalent to the, the two slits in the experiment. We've got these two possibilities for these combinatorics. And this is expressed by this bell, bell state, this single entangled bell state, which comes from this ground state annihilation. Um, so the polarization directions are uh, indicated by the X and Y. The directions are indicated by the minus and plus and the different combinations occur in an entangled way. So if we have these entangled states for the, for the annihilation gamma, how can we measure them? Okay, so luckily, process of Compton scattering depends on the, the linear polarization of the gamma. So if you look at this diagram here on the right, if you imagine 
this photon. So forget about this one here. Imagine this is an individual photon going along and undergoing a Compton scattering. Then the azimuthal distribution of where the, the Compton photons go is proportional to sine squared phi, where phi is the angle between the polarization vector and the scatter direction. Yep, so you've got a sensitivity to the polarization in this azimuthal distribution. Um, so what was done initially way back in 1947 uh, by Price and Ward uh, and independently by Snyder was to take this entangled wave function, combine it with the klein nishina um, process, and then you can work out the, the cross section for double Compton scattering. So that's what's shown on here. We have the two entangled photons and both of them undergo a Compton scattering process. Um, so what you find is that the, the overall cross section for this process, aside from some kinematic factors and constants, has a cost two delta phi modulation. So delta phi, as shown on here, is the, essentially it's phi one minus phi two. So it's the it's the the difference in angle between the, the Compton scatter planes, the azimuthal difference in angle. Yeah, so it's kind of the difference. Sorry, where's my mouse going? There we go. Um, it's the difference between the orientation of these two planes. That's the delta phi. Um, so the key thing uh, in when you use an entangled wave function like this, as opposed to just having orthogonally polarized but independent and separable photons, is the magnitude of this modulation. So the amplitude of this cos two delta phi. With entanglement, this is significantly enhanced. Uh, whereas if you don't have entanglement, it's much smaller. Um, so this was initially highlighted by Bohm and Harinoff in 1957. Um, so these initial papers just did the proper quantum mechanics and just said that was it. Whereas Bohm and Harinoff kind of, um, with all the discussions about EPR tests and other witnesses of entanglement, uh, highlighted how this was essentially an example of the kind of EPR entanglement proposed. So EPR is Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen and showed how this is effectively a test, a witness of entanglement. Okay, so for people who are interested, this historical review by Duarte is, is a really good, it's quite an interesting story about how all this developed. Um, so what we've done is to implement um, this quantum entangled expectation into J on four. Um, so J on four, many people will know, of course, is you know, probably the world's leading a uh, simulation package for understanding particle interactions in matter. Okay, so we put it into the JON4 simulation. Obviously, one of the first things to check is that you agree with the analytical theory, and this is what's shown on this slide here. Um, so the x-axis on this plot is delta phi. That's the thing I was talking about before, the azimuthal angle between these planes. Um, the blue line shows the the quantum mechanical prediction for the and the double Compton scattering of entangled uh, photons. Uh, you can clearly see this cos two delta phi modulation um, in the in the in the predictions. The the data points show the results coming from the JON four simulation where we've implemented this within it, and you can see you get very good agreement. Um, the red line shows the prediction for non entangled double Compton scattering of photons. So remember that by that, what we're assuming is that these two photons are entirely independent. So they go off with orthogonal polarization. So there will still be some cos two delta phi contribution. But aside from that, there's no, there's no connection between these. They're not entangled in the way they interact. And then you can see quite clearly that this amplitude is much smaller. So the differences between the red and the blue are the real and kind of entanglement witness effectively um you know the, the entanglement is actually crucial to to explain what we observe in nature as has been shown before and what i'll show um with our new czt system as well okay so before i go on i'll just talk about you know assumptions in the theory that we use um so as i mentioned we have this single bell state which comes from the annihilation in the ground state. Uh, you might think, what about other possibilities? So 
Um, annihilation in, in flight is at the few percent level and we neglect it as is done in sort of all previous works. Um, you might wonder if the positronium annihilation could occur, you know, other than the ground state in some kind of short-lived excited state. Um, this was investigated in purpose such as listed here uh, by looking at thermalizing the positrons in different media where the, these such effects would uh, were predicted to give differences but when they used all sorts of different media glasses metals they just couldn't see any statistical difference with the experimental data so this was neglected and we, we neglect it as well okay so we wanted to measure double Compton scattering process with real precision. Um, and for that, uh, we teamed up with Chromec and got access to these CZT detector systems. So CZT is cadmium zinc telluride. It's a high density semiconductor. Um, the, so each one of these heads shown on the figure here has a single CZT crystal, which is very highly pixelated. So we have about 121 pixels each of size roughly one millimeter and 10 millimeter depth. And we have a double headed system. So the associated kind of coincidence data acquisition uh, was developed to allow, to allow um, <clears throat> coincidence readout. Uh, and the upshot is that we can track Compton scattering with very high acceptance and efficiency. Just to give you a very brief overview. So here's a kind of a picture of a single CZT head with the 121 pixels. And here's a, an experimental event where you know, a photon enters at one point, Compton scatters, deposits energy from the electron, and then you pick up the scattered photon in a separated cluster. And from this, you can then, of course, extract the, the azimuthal scattering angle and from the energy of the electron, get the polar angle. Although with the, the CZT system, we also have access to the drift time as well, which gives independent measurement of the, the, the polar angle. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what did we observe? Okay, so the data from the CZT system is shown by the black data points. Again, plotted as a function of delta phi. You see this beautiful and very strong cos two delta phi modulation in the cross section. Um, we then took our new entangled j on four uh, simulation um, and simulated you know the exact setup of the experiment with all the correct detector geometries um, and all of the surrounding um, materials like benches um, tracking rails etc um, you could then take the the predicted energy deposits from j 4 and you can smear them to match the energy resolution of the detectors timing resolutions etc and so effectively you then have pseudo data and we could analyze the simulation with exactly the same analysis code as the experimental data, which of course minimizes sort of systematic errors and other things. Um, so after we did this, the entangled j on 4 which is shown by the blue line, you can see it gives a, you know, a really excellent description of reality, what's measured in the laboratory. Um, so the red line shows what J on four would naturally give. Um, and of course in J on four, entanglement wasn't inherently within it. So if you were simulating PET photons in J on four, they would be orthogonally polarized, but wouldn't have this entanglement uh, within them. So they're, they're effectively, in doing that, you are simulating a separable state. So you just got the orthogonally polarized gamma. And that's, I mean, that's perhaps should have mentioned that when I showed this plot here, is that here is the analytical prediction for the non-entangled orthogonally polarized. And the data points on here are just the standard J on four predictions. So you can see that they clearly agree with this separable non-entangled state. Um, just to check that everything that we see isn't a lot of junk from detector acceptance. We also simulated unpolarized photons where the orientation of the, the linear polarization vector was just random. Um, and you can see that our acceptance is rather flat. We have some acceptance effects near to zero, but generally it's flat. Um, so this kind of simulation corresponds to what would be called in sort of quantum information theory a mixed state. 
Okay, so that looks good and gives a lot of confidence. Um, so as well as utilizing the entanglement, it points out that you know any simulation of PET should really in incorporate these uh, entanglement effects to get the correct dynamics of all the scattering that goes on. Um, so we hope that this simulation will be adopted more widely in any future PET simulations, regardless of whether you utilize the entanglement or not. Okay, so we talked before about, you know, an entangled wave function and the collapse of the wave function. If you make a measurement on this entangled system, we expect it to collapse into a separable state. Um, so at this energy scale, there are absolutely, there were, there were, you know, no experimental constraints whatsoever about the collapse of the wave function between these annihilation gamma. Um, so we adapted our setup to try and get a first measurement of this. So the setup is shown here. We have a positron source and we get our two back-to-back -back entangled photons. So here's one of the, the CZT crystals in the aluminium housing of the detector. Uh, on the other path, we put in a scattering medium so that this photon essentially Compton scatters in this medium and is detected at a different angle. So we detect this photon in this crystal with the correct energy you would expect from the Compton scattering kinematics. So we're clear that our event yields, all of the photons have Compton scattered. Um, and then what we do is we then, this one scatters a second time and we measure the delta phi correlation between this gamma in the here and this gamma here. Okay, so clearly there's been a, a Compton scatter, which essentially is sensitive and gives a measurement of the polarization. So a measurement has been made on this system so what happens to the delta phi correlation? Okay, so what we measured is shown by the black data points on here. Um, obviously it's statistically quite limited. The probability of this happening, as you can imagine, is quite small. I think this was you know, about three weeks of data taken to obtain this. This system isn't optimized to measure these kind of things, but uh, we thought it was important to do. Um, so you can see that this is rather flat. Um, for comparison, if the main, if the gammas maintain their quantum entanglement, you'd expect something like this, which is clearly not the case. And the blue line shows our JM4 prediction of what you would expect where we simulated this exact setup. Now implicit in our JM4 model is the assumption that the wave function collapses following this first um, Compton scatter. So that, after this initial Compton scatter, this photon is traveling off as an independent particle and just obeying the klein Sheena formula for whatever polarization state it was left in. Um, and it seems, you know, as far as we can tell from the statistics, uh, to be consistent. Um, but at the moment, we're kind of developing systems to measure this with much higher accuracy and to explore different kinematic ranges. So, you know, we hope to have a program of measurements really to map out this wave function collapse which you know essentially this is the world data on this plot so it's you know there's clearly work to do um the other thing now now that the jayant simulation has been developed and you know we know from many different fields of physics how important a simulation is such as the jayant 4 simulation if you ever really want to accurately pull out cross sections with precision um, so another interesting point in this sort of research field is that in all the works today, only the, the correlation between these scatter planes has been measured. So this, sort of, this delta phi or the cos two delta phi dependence. Um, well, actually the cross section has never actually been measured and is a real kind of, you know, it's clearly something of fundamental importance to do. Uh, obviously with the J on four simulation, you have backgrounds under control. If you have, you know, things scattering in off the bench or all modeled in the, uh, processes other than Compton scattering, photoelectric effect, rally scattering are all in there. You can put in your detector acceptance very accurately. You can also simulate the source very accurately. Of course, these, um, these are not point sources. There's a certain distribution as to where the positrons annihilate. That can be input into the simulation and modeled accurately. You can put in all your detector resolutions, etc. So, in principle, and even from the data that we've already obtained, we can we will be able, we should be able to pull out the, the cross section. I was hoping to be able to kind of give preliminary results today, but it's still work in progress. 
uh, but we, we'd hope within the next kind of month or two that we, we should have something. Um, so the, the importance of measuring the cross section really is more in terms of fundamental tests. Um, so, I mean, Ruth will talk about the uh, using this delta phi correlation in PET imaging, some work of an application that's already started. Um, but in terms of going on and, you know, pushing fundamental tests at this MEV scale, uh, this, this cross section is important. Um, and just to give one instance of this, um, in this paper here and many others, it was highlighted how the lack of knowledge, you know, direct experimental determination of the cross section affects, um, you know, pulling out information on things like tests of Bell's inequalities from positron annihilation gamma. Okay, Bell's inequalities is a lecture in itself, but I'll just try and do it in one slide very quickly. Um, so in quantum mechanics, a given state of a quantum system cannot specify with certainty the results of all possible measurements that can be made on a system. So it's clearly a probabilistic theory. Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen didn't like this kind of throwing dice aspect and they proposed a hidden variable theory where the physical system actually did have a set of variables which determine with certainty all possible measurements, but these of course had to be hidden, hidden variables. Uh, Bell's inequality differentiates between these two uh, hypotheses. Um, so if you have two measuring instruments, A and B, and imagine that A and B have knobs which is set to positions little a or little b respectively, uh, and locality uh, implies that the, the knob setting has no effect. So the knob setting A has no effect on the measurement B. And so there's a, a bunch of different kind of um, combinations of this, which go into this Bell's inequality and shows that if you have locality, this must be less than two. Um, Bowman and Haranoff pointed out that positron annihilation gamma were examples of this and could be tested. Um, so in that scenario, alpha and beta are the output of the two detectors and A and B would be the angle of the detectors. So that's the kind of the setting on the knob. Um, and so what you can do is extract from experiment these appropriate terms. For example, this term is just cos 2 A minus B, where A and B are the angles of the detectors. And you can equivalently calculate it in quantum mechanical theory uh, as well. And then you can compare um, whether this inequality is exceeded. Um, unfortunately, the original proposal by Bowman and Harinoff is, is certainly correct if you can, um, if you had an ideal polarization detector. Uh, but of course, in this energy range, we're, we're dealing with Compton scattering, so it's not an ideal uh, polarization analyzer. You don't get, you know, absolute measurement of the polarization. You're just measuring a distribution of Compton scattered photons, which reflects the polarization. Um, so although the measurements do, uh, you know, in principle rule out the hidden variable theories and, and, you know, have application to other fundamental tests, they're based on assumptions. And the assumptions that were there was that it is in principle possible to construct an ideal linear polarization analyzer and the results obtained in an experiment using ideal analyzers and those from Compton scattering are correctly related by quantum theory. So these are the kind of the, the assumptions that are needed. Um, and of course, the fundamental tests are quite a purist field. Um, and so really for this point two, cross-section measurements are really important because obviously checking this aspect is, is crucial and the fact it's not been determined by experiment is a bit of a, a lacking for the field. Okay, so that's, you know, that's hopefully this cross section will be with us in a few months and we'll, we'll see what it shows. Um, so for the final part of the talk, I'll just outline some of the plans we have going forward. Um, so we want to do a, a series of measurements uh, sort of relating to fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. And obviously there's been a lot of work done in, with optical photons uh, with this, in this regard. And you might wonder, well, why bother the MEV scale? Um, so, I mean, the first point is it breaks new ground. So, you know, we might not expect to see any differences, but, you know, null results are still important. And many 
experiments in physics have given unexpected results with big consequences so we can do it and i think it's important that we, we should do it um and measurements of you know fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics are you know in some respects easier at the higher energy we have the disadvantages i talked about before but if you're detecting these photons it's virtually noise three the energy deposits are well above thermal noise in a detector and as you've seen, there's a very clear entanglement witness that we can measure in the delta phi. And we're going to complement that with a cross section as well. And also at the MEV scale, I mean, we can't, you know, beforehand to prove that there's some direct synergy. And if you're measured in the optical regime, we don't need to measure in the MEV regime. Um, so one clear difference, of course, is that the wavelengths are six orders of magnitude smaller. So here we're at uh, MEV scale opticals at the EV scale. So you've got, you know, this factor of a million. So for a given distance in the lab, you've had a million times more cycles of the wave function than you would have for the equivalent of optical systems. Uh, and also the higher energy has other effects. Clearly, as you go higher in energy, you can have a stronger interaction with the vacuum. So the self energy of the photon in the vacuum is, is different because of the energy and, you know, it's sort of postulated that the photon actually has a magnetic moment due to these self-energy interactions, which is absolutely negligible at the optical scale. Um, if you're looking at the, the photons in a, a gravitational field, uh, the gravitational redshift, of course, is proportional to EG H over C squared. So the, the actual absolute shift in the energy of the photons as they travel up a gravitational field is a million times uh, larger than the optical regime. Um, and okay, I mean, obviously quantum mechanics and uh, gravitation are not, and general relativity are not really combined in a, an effective theory, but in uh, the coupling of a photon to a hypothetical graviton is 10 to the 12 times larger because it's proportional to one over the wavelength squared. So, I mean, obviously we're not talking about scattering off gravitons, that would be ridiculous, but it gives, you know, a sense that things might be different. Um, so we want to do uh, distance tests of entanglement. So the record in the optical regime is 1,200 kilometers at optical wavelengths, you know, which corresponds to 10 to the 12 wavelengths over which it's measured. This was done by sending entangled photons from a satellite down to ground stations, which were separated by this distance. And they saw that the, the entanglement was, you know, as expected, nothing changed. Um, at the MEV scale, uh, distance tests in which you're moving the detectors further away have been done around the one meter scale. Uh, so the data is sparse. I think there's only two uh, measurements, which are in some senses, well, they are contradictory. Some of them give slightly different results, but the latter result was seen to be the better experiment. Um, and in these experiments, the entanglement witness they measured was just this delta phi correlation so the magnitude of this cost two delta phi distribution obtained at a very fixed kinematic so both the photons scattered kind of close to 90 degrees and they just measured you know essentially the height of this the height of the cost two delta phi modulation they didn't actually measure the distribution itself um, so with these new systems such as CZT we can do benchmark measurements out to tens of meters so we can really exceed the current record uh, in terms of wavelengths, even from this, by kind of orders of magnitude. Uh, we can measure for a wide range of scatter angles simultaneously. We're not just measuring perpendicular scattering. We can check across all of the different theta ranges that things look consistent. So not, we'll not only measure the correlation, we'll also measure the cross section. And, you know, clearly the advances in J on 4 are key for this. Uh, if you want, you know, measurements with small systematic areas, your acceptance and backgrounds need to be under control. And now we're in a position that that can be done. Uh, and we will also obtain the first measurement vertically. Essentially the entanglement between positron annihilation gammas has only ever been measured horizontally. And we'll, we'll, we'll carry out some first tests uh, when, it, when the photons are traveling in a gravitational field. Um, there's a lot of interest in the cons the constancy of entanglement, sorry, I'm not speaking well, constancy of entanglement in accelerating frames. So in many works, it's been suggested that gravity and motion could have observable effects on quantum entanglement. For example, here's a reference here. 
uh, because of these the importance of this it was this is you know a very important measurement in the optical regime so there's a only obtained in 2017 uh, was measurements of the entangled optical photons entangled in their linear polarization states uh, and they put the they put the the detectors on a centrifuge and accelerated from 30 uh, um, milli g up to 30 g and observed constancy uh, so we plan to do similar measurements at the mev scale to seem to ensure that also MEV scale entanglement is independent of uh, constant acceleration. Um, okay, and we're also exploring possibilities to measure entanglement in laser accelerated positron systems as well. Um, so on this final slide, I'll just list some of the other possibilities that we're looking at, which might be of interest to people. And we're certainly, you know, very interested to discuss with potential collaborators. Um, so a major source of entangled photons in the optical regime are cascade transitions in atoms. So for example, here, and this is one of the most commonly used transitions, you have a, a J equals zero state going via a J equals one state back to a J equals zero state. And then what happens is that the, the gammas are emitted are entangled in terms of the two possible orientations of this magnetic substrate. So you can have MJ equals plus one or minus one, and the, the photons are entangled with these two possibilities. And what we're starting to look at is nuclear transitions. I mean, if you have similar transitions in a nucleus or even you know transitions with different spin configurations, what is the role of entanglement and can we measure it and can we use it? Um, as well, we want to try and push the energy frontier. Um, so the maximum energy at which photon entanglement is measured is the 0.5111 MeV energy of positron annihilation gamma. Uh, we've started to look at whether we can learn about entanglement from the decay of the pi zero meson. So this decays to two gammas. Um, it's also a spin zero state, so these should be entangled. Um, the pi zero is a lifetime, you know, 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Its lifetime is much shorter than the positronium, which is the order of nanoseconds. Um, so these decay photons will have 70 MeV in the rest frame. Uh, and of course, these pi zeros are produced in nuclear reactions predominantly. And so you can get highly relativistically boosted frames and you can get, you know, photons up to GeV. And we're very interested to test the constancy of entanglement with going into a relativistically boosted frame, which um, has not been measured for, for photon entanglement. Of course, measuring the polarization is very challenging at these higher energies. The probability of Compton scattering of these photons is essentially zilch. Um, so you need to, you know, think of different ways of doing it. And one of the, the things that we're kind of looking at is to actually infer the polarization from nuclear reactions. So particularly reactions of this kind of type, where you have a photon hitting a nucleus and you have the coherent production of a pi zero meson. This has, you know, tremendously large cross sections for a photon. You know, we have the sort of cross sections you normally get in hadronic reactions. And also interestingly, it has 100% analyzing power. So, um, you know, it's in principle, we can get much better information on the, the polarization state of the gamma than is accessible in Compton scattering. Um, and of course, this reaction of, is easier to detect because it's a charged particle in the final state. It doesn't have quite the high analyzing power, but might be, you know, the first step on, on this route. Okay, so to summarize, we've included quantum entanglement um, into JOM4. We've benchmarked it with a CZT system, and we see, you know, that clearly this is necessary to sim accurately simulate the scatter plane correlations in, in Compton scattering. Um, Ruth will talk about our first application of this in PET imaging in a talk later today. Um, so our next steps, we really want to get more detailed measurements of wave function collapse at the MEV scale. You know, this is totally new stuff. Uh, we want to measure this cross section and then we're going to move on to fundamental tests and further applications. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. 
you had a few comments and questions in the chat. Uh, Vivek had a few comments. If you would like to talk directly to Dan. Yeah, Vivek. actually, I saw Nico's comment. I mean, if there are students who want to ask questions, I mean, maybe perhaps they should get priority. Mm -hmm. But if there's none, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to ask the question. Maybe you can get started while the okay. students wake up. Okay. Okay, so I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, would it be a nice idea to measure the uh, helicity of the neutrino using uh, uh, by using your setup to measure the circular polarization of the gamma ray emitted in uh, 152 European electron capture? Yeah, I mean, that's also, I mean, I didn't mention in the talk, that is also something we're doing, right? Yeah, to, yeah, because the linear polarization um, is entangled, but also circular polarization will be entangled as well. So if we can measure the circular polarization of the gamma, we should be able to pick up sensitivity to that. But you'd need it. Yeah, I think high. the uh, Gold Harbor measurement is, I think, at a 10 or 20% level. 20% if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it is yeah. of course expected that it, uh, the neutrino has a helicity, but nevertheless, uh, experimentally, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a you know, very coarse measurement. And yeah. The other thing is that this uh, spin dependence of the Compton scattering could also be perhaps done with your uh, setup, right? Yeah. At rate of iron, which is magnetized and non-magnetized and so on. Yeah, no, we've been looking at, you know, possibilities for that using, you know, you can get, you know, very good sort of yeah. uh, permanent magnets with all the new technologies or new materials that are being used. So, yeah, yeah, if you scatter from a magnetized... A sample in which the electrons are polarized, we can access the circular polarization. It's a, it's a beautiful setup that you have. I mean, yeah, it's very, yeah, no, it says it. CZT is very nice, yeah, so yeah, it would, yeah. yeah. No, that's certainly something that, that we'd be started to look at, and that's really, yeah, really nice comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Elijah has a question. If you want to unmute yourself. So if two or more annihilation events occur simultaneously in the source, producing uh, uh, five elevens uh, uh, moving in opposite directions, how do you identify the specific gamma rays corresponding to a specific event? So the yeah, I mean the the rates the the rate that we detect in our setup the the source is such that the you know we the the rate of random you know events where if you're getting one photon from one annihilation event and another one's actually from a different annihilation event is just really small. So the typical rate in our detectors was I think it was to the order of like less than a hertz. So it's like you know so the the chances of that are very small and we can of course, measure the out of time events to measure what fraction of those there are. So if we look, rather than looking in coincidence, we look away from the coincidence time, we can see what fraction of random events there are. So in our data set, it's, it's, it's negligible in the, in the CZT data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to say the coincidence rate, the the false coincidence rate must be the activity of the source, not the rate in your detector. Say that again, sorry. Well, if you, you know, the activity in the source must be below uh, the, well below the, the, the probability that you'll get a double hit in the resulting time of, of, of a coincidence. So it's, What's important is the activity of the source in terms of random coincidences, not the rate of your detector. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, any random um, events would have a flat delta phi distribution as well. So in, in terms of the method that we're applying it to, um, as Ruth will talk about in her talk, because they have a flat delta phi dependence, we can identify those and assess the contribution um, in the application with PET imaging. Um, yeah, and if there was a very strong role for these things in the, our measurement, we wouldn't, you know, you'd see the delta five totally flattened out, but okay, yeah. 
Uh, I'm sure it's not an issue because um, probably you got a very, very good time resolution. So you could probably get a, a fairly hot source. So, so some. Uh, yeah, I think if we go up to much stronger sources, we, that's something we, we definitely have to take care of. I think in the measurements we've taken, it's not a, a significant effect. We did some estimates. Okay. If everybody is happy, we will thank Dan again for your presentation. And we will move on to our third presentation this morning from Simon Connell from the University of Johannesburg. We will hear about more applications of positron emission tomography. Okay, uh, my mic was open. My screen yes. should be shared.